don't look backwards, always look forwards and live a life of, you know, that is complete, not just about work and not just about having fun that you need to actually uh, live uh, a life full of both and don't try and overwork yourself because sometimes that doesn't actually amount to a a positive for your your own well-being so you have to figure out balance balance is very very important welcome to the strategic momentum podcast the show where we share tips stories and advice from progressive leaders on what it takes to break through that business inertia and propel you and your business forward i'm your host connie Steele. On this show, our focus has been helping listeners understand the strategies, approaches, and perspectives needed to solve the common challenges plaguing businesses today. But another factor in breaking through the business inertia is developing the foundational hard and soft skills needed to thrive today and in the future. These guests have been through a lot of trying situations as their careers have progressed, from dealing with leadership conflicts or watching their startups fail, to losing their jobs or jumping from company to company in search of the right fit. And these experiences taught them the valuable lessons that ultimately led to career success in the long run. So today, because this is our 50th episode and the first major milestone for the Strategic Momentum Podcast, we've decided to round up the best career advice our guests have given on this show so far. Because it is our mission to help up and coming leaders gain the personal and professional skills needed to navigate their career and reach their full growth potential. We'll start with this episode appropriately by looking at the advice about starting or jumping into your career. While some guests started with a more linear path, going from school into their first jobs and then progressing upward within their field, others relied on their own confidence and a leap of faith to get hired into the roles that ultimately laid out the rest of their careers. Aline Cox is one such example. She's the executive producer for WGN Chicago Morning News. And in episode 22, she shared her experience getting her first job and the lessons learned along the way. Well, to make a long story short, uh, I fell into the business somewhat. I wanted to spend a summer in Madison where we went to college together. And so I decided to get an internship. And back in those days, we had phone books. And my parents said, since you don't have a job and you don't need college credit, get an internship. So I was thumbing through the phone book and I got to the letter T and television sounded intriguing. And uh, that day, I called up the television station that I watched the evening news the night before and got to the anchor and said, I'd like to stay in Madison for the summer, and I think you'd really like me. Do you have internships? And the woman told me that they had picked their interns months and months earlier than when I had called. But I convinced the woman to give me an interview and told her that she'd like me, and in the end, she did hire me. Um, And then from that first day interning at the ABC affiliate in Madison, Wisconsin, I realized I loved television. And that's how it all got started. Wow. Who would have thought when you were at you know University of Wisconsin with me that all of a sudden you found your vocation just thumbing through a phone book? Right. And that another important lesson from that is I just clicked with the female anchor and I was a business major at the time. So I probably was not the most qualified. And I learned, and my dad had told me this earlier in life, that the best person often doesn't get hired for the job because there have been other jobs I applied for where I was the most qualified, but I didn't click with the person hiring me. That was a good lesson that apply for jobs. And even if you're not the most qualified, you may get it because you were the most liked. Tom Shu, founder of the management consulting firm Optimum Effect Group, had a similar experience. He spent his early days as a sniper in the U.S. Marine Corps, 
But when an injury led to his discharge, he had to figure out a new way to support himself and his son. So he decided to go into sales, despite having zero experience and no college degree. His determination, self-reliance, and resilience learned during his time in the military proved invaluable as he ventured into this new career path. So I went down to Sears. I bought a Hager wrinkle-free suit, a Stafford shirt and tie, and I wore my shiny Marine Corps shoes because I didn't have enough money to buy a pair of shoes as well as all that other fancy stuff. So I showed up at the office and um, I had the American Express, the big office, and said I had an appointment with the fella, the vice president. A very confused vice president came walking out to the waiting room to meet with me. He says, well, come back to my office. And he says, you know, I don't have an appointment in my schedule. He said, but um, that, he said, my assistant usually keeps a pretty good schedule. And I said, well, actually, you don't. His name was George. I said, well, you don't, you don't have an appointment with me, George, but I'm going to be the best person you're ever going to hire. And that was my first real sale. I, I sold George on hiring. And a few years later, we were having a meeting. Uh, you know, we were out celebrating. I'd become a vice president, one of the more quicker promoted ones in, in the, at that company's history. And they were saying, talking about where they went to college. And George asked me where I went to college. And I said, I never went to college. <laughs> he said, well, how did you get hired? And so no, no one ever asked. So, so, that, <laughs> uh, so that's how I got in there. Never, everything I do, everything I've done in my professional life, I take, if, I, if I'm going to do it, I do it, you know, 100%. And I, and I don't stop for obstacles. I don't allow self-defeat to creep in. Uh, you know, the only thing that can defeat you in life is yourself. Everything else is just window dressing. We're all, you know, carbon-based life forms here on the planet, all trying to succeed, suck air out of the atmosphere, three hots in a cot, and take care of our family. And so you you are the only person that's going to make yourself successful. And so the only person that can make you unsuccessful is you, right? So um, so resilience, you know, the, uh, the being able to get, you know, punched in the face and get back up again. So from Aline and Tom, the lesson learned is to show up and believe in yourself. Even if you don't have the exact set of skills and experience someone is looking for, whether it's saying, you're going to like me, or I'm going to be the best salesman you're going to hire, demonstrating to someone else that you have the confidence and believe you will do well will get you farther than simply having all the right credentials on your resume. But for some, settling into their career didn't mean just landing the job. It meant finding their purpose. I've interviewed several entrepreneurs on this show, and many of them started their own companies, not in the pursuit of revenue, but because they wanted more out of life. And they shared their advice for how to figure out not just what you're good at, but what you are truly meant to do. Stefan Fitch had a great gig at Forbes, where he was their Chicago bureau chief. However, after getting a $50 parking ticket one day, as he was going in to quickly grab a bag of coffee, he realized that while he had this terrific journalism job, it wasn't doing everything he needed it to, to support his family. To continue to move up would require him to move to New York City, an option that wasn't really something he wanted to do. And there were other market and industry dynamics happening that were fundamentally changing the media business. And so he started to ask himself if there were better choices that could give him the professional fulfillment he desired, while also providing enough money to support his family and offer them the lifestyle they wanted. Stefan ended up starting his own content company, that operates virtually and lets both himself and his employees work from where they feel most comfortable and where they can produce their best work. His advice for finding your purpose is twofold. And one of the things I realized, not only was I going to be capable of that, but it really was more authentically who I felt I was. And I had, you know, you don't necessarily have a choice to be exactly who you are when you're 22 years old and you just had a college and you need to go make a page. You got to go give the world what it wants. But I was reaching a point in my life where I was like, you know, what do I want? Um, do I want to go back to New York and be that, that grumpy editor, you know, after spending 20 years as a grumpy writer? Or do I want to 
like taking a different direction. I think my when I was 22, I kind of wanted to write write it write the first you know great American novel, right? But I decided, you know, what, let me go spend some time learning about writing and learning about life and see if I could maybe write that novel a little later. It was not a bad decision, you know. It was it was yes, but yeah. The two big ones are: what would you do if you couldn't if you knew you couldn't fail, and then recognize, hey, it's a long run. I don't need to make it all do do it all today. I could actually pace myself a bit and 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 maybe get more out of this and get more out of life. For Dr. Richard Schuster, host of the Daily Helping podcast, and my guest in episode 28, a nearly fatal car accident drove him to reevaluate his entire life and make the decision that altered the rest of his career. As he flipped through the air, time slowed down, and he asked himself, like, what am I proud of? What have I accomplished? And I made some money. I traveled. You know, I, I really, you know, enjoyed things and, and things for the sake of having things, not things because I was, you know, deeply interested in what they represented or a passion. And I was really quite ashamed of myself in that regard as well. So I didn't make this bargain, you know, with dear God, if you let me live, you know, like, <laughs> like in a Christmas story that I'm going to change everything around. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I, I recognized that if I lived, things had to change. And, and in, a, in that accident, which was quite significant, I, I broke my back. I suffered severe internal injuries and uh, did some significant damage to my neck as well. So I had quite a long time to convalesce and really was thinking about, you know, what's what's the next step? After the accident, he left the IT consulting company he built and didn't know what to do with himself. After a chance conversation with some mothers in a grocery store about social media, he ended up volunteering his tech skills to help people learn about internet safety. This led to other altruistic endeavors of which he found incredibly fulfilling. These experiences were the triggers that compelled him to go back to school, where he earned master's degrees in social work and psychology, as well as a doctorate in clinical psychology. He now dedicates his life to helping make a difference in the lives of others. Here's what he told me about finding your purpose in your career. So part of becoming in alignment and finding what your purpose is, once you've done that first step and you've really become very crystal clear on what your values are. And once you find what's important to you, you have to surround yourself with people who share that mindset or share that commitment. So it doesn't mean like if you want to, if your passion is, you know, creating a no-kill shelter for dogs, that doesn't mean that you have to surround yourself just with people that want to do the same thing. But you have to surround yourself with people that think and like the same kind of ideas, generally speaking, that you do. You know, if you are very negative and you surround yourself with negative people, you're not going to break out of that cycle. And then as you move towards defining these into goals, whatever those goals may be, you surround yourself with people who will hold you accountable for those actions. And I'm not saying if you don't have those things, you can't achieve a goal. But when you have those other boxes checked off, it makes it far, far more easy to succeed. Success means a lot of things for different people. It could be reaching the highest position at a company, hitting a revenue goal for your business, or as the last two guests shared, it could mean finding and living your purpose. For Stefan and Dr. Schuster, their careers involved one pivotal shift that rerouted their careers and propelled them into what they really wanted to do. But what advice have my guests had for people who have needed to jump around more frequently to find what they were after? Deepak Shukla's episode was titled, Fighting Your Path, How a Habit of Experimentation Can Accelerate Your Career. And his advice reflected just that, testing and learning to find what you're really good at. Deepak shared a lot of advice in this episode as he explained how he went from working as a tax consultant to running a recording studio and a tutoring company to even spending a year training with the British Special Forces. But here's some of the best advice he gave about experimentation and overcoming fear of the risk-taking. You know, the biggest thing that, you know, I, I, I kind of figured out when I was younger is that I am the one that's getting in the way of myself and actually um there's 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 never been any issue 
with any of my repurposing. There hasn't been one moment where anybody has called me a fraud for, you know, perhaps presenting myself as the, you know, being a Tudor or being um, a digital marketer or being an SEO guy or being a tax consultant. And, and, and it's, it's often been fear, of course, that has, has stopped many of us, including myself in some spaces, from actually taking the action. Because when you discover what's on the other side, it's, 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 it's 95% of the time a lot less worse than you think it will be. One of the things that have been really pivotal for me also is adding a level of accountability. But, but, but you know, people hear about this kind of accountability stuff and it's like, okay, but, but there needs to be, there needs to be, you know, for me, there's been negative repercussions to not living up to your own actions. Not, 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 people don't chase reward. They run from the risk of failure. They run from punishment. And, and, and that's what, you know, we need to kind of use as leverage because it's our mammalian brains, of course, that are a lot more well-developed. This whole kind of cognition and these conversations we have, that's, that's kind of the surface. If you unpack that, there's, there's just kind of lots of basal instincts. And if you activate the fear, but in a way that supports your growth, then brilliant. Deepak also adds advice for testing and learning to grow your skills. And a lot of it is based on self-education, but learning in a way that benefits the people around you as well. I think that there's, 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 it, it, it's about doing anything that borders or journeys into your stretch zone. You know, and there's any version of that. I, I definitely, you know, don't want to communicate the idea that, well, Deepak, I'm not going to just quit my job and go and then try and do this and try and do that. That's not the, the message I want to communicate. But what you can do to then, you know, find your value and you can, you can, you can, you can begin some of the more practical elements of the journey that might be scary. You know, and, and you know, an example of this being um, when I was at Deloitte, one of the first books that I bought was How to Think Like a CEO because I just thought it made sense to look at a book that can guide me as to the politics of the career workplace, because that was not an education that I'd been given by um, any of the training that I'd received at Deloitte. It was all technical, and then you learn soft skills, but you don't learn formally. So that was something that was powerful. And, you know, from that, I learned about, you know, become the Excel master in the office, because if you're the guy that can do VBA lookups and all of these crazy functions, you will get in the room when it comes to some of the more important stuff. That was number one. Number two, I learned that when someone gives you a project, find out from somebody else how they like to receive their project. Do they like their lines end stops? Do they like italics or underlines? Do they like, you learn all of these small things that ultimately can help you get into people's good books. And, and you know, that's just one practical example of how people can, you know, start doing things they've not yet done. And, and in the um, process of doing that, you will learn new things. You will get access to new opportunities and, you know, a journey or a new door may reveal itself to you that didn't previously exist because you stuck your head above the parapet in quite a structured still, but, but, but uh, quite a new, but still safe way. So I think that, um, you know, for those who are suffering inertia or analysis paralysis or kind of sitting on the fence, you know, something as small as that would, I think, fall into kind of the remit of, okay, great. That can give you a new kind of, you know, uh, code that you can apply to the workplace to see what kind of return that you get. I'm an art student. One of the things that was really good for me, guys, was books. When I decided to make any transition, I would immediately Google, or Amazon in this case, the top 10 bestsellers, and I would buy all of those books and I would read all of them. And then I would just journey into that world once I'd gained a, a, a significant amount of knowledge. So I think that, you know, if you're thinking about doing something that you've not yet done, go out and get the data, read it in aggressive, read it in an aggressive fashion, acquire all of the knowledge that you think is relevant to making that move, and then go out and do it. Maytag Bagal, a serial entrepreneur and co-founder of the private equity firm Carta Ventures, made $500,000 doing business on Facebook before he was 22. For him, testing and learning is an essential part of everything he does, in business and in life which are essentially inseparable. He told me in episode 37 how this mindset propels his and his team's careers. Uh, for us, we see it as more risky to not be taking risks and learning. It's better for us to lose money and have learned a really good lesson than for us to have 
not taking that risk and potentially risk losing our whole business later because we weren't constantly learning and iterating. That, that's a big thing for us. And we, we do have fear. It's just different for us. It's, we're more afraid of losing the entire business because we got lazy about learning. And we'd rather lose, I guess, comparatively, a little bit of money here and there. And sometimes we do have big losses. Like, say, we, we make an investment and we, we completely miss time or we mess something up. Um, it, it can happen. But it's not really a big deal if we learned a lesson. Um, and to me, that's fairly valuable, especially if you learn the lesson, relatively speaking, inexpensively. And early on. While Maytab is still in his 20s and probably wise beyond his years, his thoughts are echoed by business veteran Pierre Hadaya, professor, consultant, and co author of Business Architecture The Missing Link in Strategy Formulation, Implementation, and Execution. Pierre's entire career has been based on the need to apply the theoretical perspective with the practical application. And to do so, it involves continuous improvement to implement and realize change. He preaches the value of ongoing learning to his students, along with other practical career advice. It took me many years to find the exact thing that I really, really wanted to do. Okay? So the first thing I suggest is think long-term. Okay? It's not true that if you study in a field and so forth, uh, whether at 18, 19, 20, or even 25, that you'll be doing the same thing in when you're 50 or 60. You have to think long-term. But knowledge compounds. As Warren Buffett says, knowledge compounds. So it's important that as you evolve and you keep learning and trying new things, you try to learn things that are going to complement the things that you learned before. Because if you start learning things in field X and then in field Y and there's no connection between the two, that I don't think it's going to be effective. We mentioned about, uh, I don't know if I mentioned it, but um, I always show a video to my students from uh, the ex-CEO of Otis who says that specialists have to become generalists. I love this sentence because for me, it summarizes everything. You have to be very good in one field. So you have to have a circle of competence, which they always say in finance, but you also need to be a generalist and be able to talk to the people around you and have a better idea of how you can help them and how they can help you achieve your work. The, four, the, the, the third thing is, I mentioned it a few minutes ago, you have to work on your biases because I have a lot of biases and I love when you say, Pep Connie, and you tell me, Pierre, are you sure you're right about this? And I'm going to say, well, you know what? Maybe you're right. This bias is, 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 is leading me into the wrong direction. Another thing I always tell my students is choose the people you want to work with, not the companies. Okay. Uh, of course, it's, it, it would be great that you work for a very famous company and so forth and so on, but you, you work with people. And it is these people who's gonna, who are going to help you to go forward in your career. So in my life, I always focused on the people before the companies. And usually, or very often, there are very good people in very good companies but always focus on the people. For some people, they might not know that they even need to experiment with their career because they've grown comfortable in existing roles, but that can lead to stagnation, which ultimately limits your growth potential. My guest on the last episode, Anita John, founder of ARJ Consulting, had advice for that situation as well. It's interesting because when um, when I think about you know all the jobs you know that I've had, um, I always believe and still uh, believed and still believe that even if you're comfortable in a job, you should always take an interview. You should always interview and keep not only yourself fresh, but you never know what the opportunities are. And I think that's part of the whole test and learn, uh, which is you are always trying new things because what you even though what you are doing is working you never know if it could work better and when you do leave a job she said always look towards the future don't look backwards always look forwards and live a life of you know that is complete not just about work and not just about having fun that you need to actually uh, live uh, a life full of both and don't try and overwork yourself because 
sometimes that doesn't actually amount to a a positive for your your own well being. Um, so you have to figure out balance. Balance is very very important. Finding a balance in your career and personal life was an important topic in Amani Green's episode as well. She is the founder of the advertising consultancy Green Group. For her, creating balance came down to understanding one's own strengths, yet always trying new things, but also knowing when to do something yourself and when to delegate. And I think that's what has allowed me to be able to spend more quality time doing quality things. I'm wiser about the things that I'm, that I'm not good at now. And I have very little, um, need or, uh, reason to do so. I can bring people on into my life to, you know, create a beautiful PowerPoint report or do a manicure, (laughs) you know, it's all, you know, there, there, there are lots of things that I'm not great at, but I, I'm happiest when I'm doing the things that I am good at and I'm doing those with the potential outcome or the hopeful outcome or the desired outcome, at least, of being proud of, the, of what I've put into it, being proud of what I've put into it. And that goes across the board. That's, that's applicable professionally, you know, for my clients, for my colleagues. Um, it's, a question, it's, it's, it's applicable to my family. It's applicable to my friends. Um, I just try to be, to do a job that I can be proud of. And I get better at that as I grow up. Absolutely. And I can completely relate to that. It's, it's knowing where your strengths are and capitalizing on that, but also being honest with yourself and with your clients, knowing that here's where I can deliver the most value and where I know that I can support you in finding others that could be maybe better suited to address you in all these versus forward telling and saying that I can do everything. Right. You know, at the end of the day, that's just going to be better for them because you're really right. thinking about the mutual benefit um, versus the transactional nature of you know getting more money for the business. Right. And that's not to say that you're not always trying new things because I am. Um, and, and I'm always adding new things to the list of things I'm, I'm doing well. And sometimes the things that I used to be doing well, you know, I'm doing, I find that as I add a list, as, add to the list of things I do well, I'm, you know, maybe other things are falling off the list. So there's always growth and evolution. Um, but, you know, just sort of concentrating on on the spaces where you can really, to use your words, add value is, is generally good counsel. Understanding where you can add value and dedicating your time to that is an important part of growing your career strategically. Testing and learning to evolve helps you get to that point where you can easily identify and outline what you're best at. And another part of growing your career is learning how to manage it and allocating the necessary time in your schedule to focus on it. For some people, especially those with the entrepreneurial mindset, work and life are inherently linked and career growth is innately ingrained into everything they do. But for others, it becomes too easy to get lost in the day-to-day tasks. And so you forget to take the time to evaluate where you are and work towards what's next. In episode 23, Dan Yu, the founder of Fastbook Advisors, a new kind of talent agency, shared advice for job hunters and hiring managers on how to find the right fit for any role. But Dan shared some advice at the end of his interview that is really applicable to everyone. Well, it's it's running your career like a business, right? And if if you're looking at your business, well, you know what what's the what's the revenue, right? So that's your salary and your bonus and what's your what's your revenue continuity plan? Look at it that way. Uh, this goes back to running your career strategically. Um, if you are running a business, uh, you want to make sure that you have a disaster recovery or a business continuity plan. So have multiple plans. Um, you might even want to have ulti- uh, 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 other revenue streams. So you might ha- you might have a uh, side hustle or side gig. But really, it's about never stop looking. It's about networking. It's about uh, creating your social presence, being a subject matter expert potentially, and blogging, um, being on Twitter and connecting with uh, potential connectors that are out there. So uh, you know, have, having, having that network work for you, it's about 
It's about having this long-term view. Um, what, one of the things that I like to talk about when I speak to, uh, to talent is the 50% rule. So half your day in an ideal world is doing your job. And the other half is actually managing your career. Uh, I can speak to my own career and, and how, I, um, how I learned this myself. Um, when I was early in my career, I was go, go, go. And I was all about the client. I was handling some, uh, some really big mutual fund clients as a trader and a salesperson. I was all about the client. And I didn't manage my career at all. I was, I was really good at my job, but I was not very good at managing my career. And when I say that half of your day is doing your job and half of day is managing your career, the managing your career part of your day really can be networking. Um, it can be uh, going to conferences, but it really is about creating your presence and, and demonstrating your responsibilities. And it could be sending the right email. It could be sending that, uh, that victory lap email and congratulating everybody else on your team and not taking any credit for, your, for yourself. And being that magnanimous and generous person, not counting points, but really helping them appreciate you. Because in... In your career, you're going to have a lot of different contacts, but clients, uh, the people that work for you, your peers, your, your managers, your vendors and competitors, really, you, you know, that having that uh, dynamic and that network work for you over the long term, a lot of it is really uh, managing your presence and uh, calling people back in a timely fashion. The fundamentals of business. Really, it's it's so important to to be generous and to be kind, uh, especially in networking and helping people and giving back to your community, uh, which then is really that half of your day of managing your career. In most interviews, I end by asking the guests to share the advice they would give to their younger selves, knowing what they know now. So to close this episode, I'm rounding up some of my favorite responses that are applicable to really anyone who's trying to work their way up and create meaning in their careers. Here's Erin Gargan King, author of Digital Persuasion, giving her advice that also goes back to the test and learn mentality. I would tell my younger self to try ideas on a smaller level first before diving all in. So if you are listening to this podcast and you have entrepreneurial aspirations, learn from my mistakes, test on a very small level before you jump all in. My first company was called Jump Digital Media because I just jumped into it without really any plan, anything. And it was tricky. I mean, at one point I had to put payroll on my credit card. I had legal troubles. I learned so many tough lessons, sleepless nights, losing my hair, you know, just making mistakes because I, I, I jumped in at scale first. Try something. If you want to start a business, if you want to try a new initiative, test it. Try a little teeny bit and just see what happens. Make sure you have a working prototype. Make sure you have some key indicators that from a data standpoint that this is going to maybe have legs before you dump all your savings into it or all your heart and soul or you hire all your friends or you get that expensive office. Try to ensure that a little bit works first as insurance to set yourself up for success and then take that risk, but take a calculated one. For John Knudsen, co-founder of the Financial Marketing Summit, my guest in episode 30, career growth is not just about gaining skills and knowledge, but also building a genuine network of people. He shares his advice to his younger self. Education is great. Knowing how to do things is really important, but knowing people is just as important. And so you got to get out there and get involved and you have to actually go out and just show up places. Your personality isn't going to really fit with a lot of people. There's going to be people who, hey, maybe they represent a lot of great opportunity, but you and they just do not connect. And you shouldn't have to feel like you have to connect with everybody. What you're really doing is you're showing up, trying to be helpful and trying to kind of fish for the people that you have genuine connections with um, and that you enjoy doing business with. Because um, over time, that's really what matters. Like the, the opportunities you get and the best things that the best 
connections you get are going to be people who see the world the way you see it, right? The people who want to actually be connected with you because of who you are and how you act. And for ConsultingSuccess.com co-founder Michael Zapersky, it's about being committed to what you're doing, whatever that might be. I think the, the biggest lessons that I've learned and that I think, you know, if I implement to myself when I was younger, um, <clears throat> could have helped me make, you know, to be even more successful or to reach um, bigger or more meaningful goals is this idea of, of being committed versus interested. There's a lot of people who will say they want to do something, but they, they talk about it. Uh, they might even plan around it. They might feel like they're you know, uh, doing the right things to get there by, by planning and thinking and discussing it, but they never actually take action on that plan. Uh, and so the big thing is getting very clear on what you want and then deciding that you're going to be committed to it. Because when you make a commitment to something or to someone, then whether you take action on that or not, whether you show up when you say that you were going to show up, whether you do what you say that you are going to do defines who you are. Uh, and that goes way beyond just one transaction. That is your reputation. That is your relationship with others. That is how you feel about yourself and whether or not you have regrets. So I think what I've tried my best to do over the years, but I'm, there's always room for improvement, is to make those commitments, stick to those commitments, um, and and benefit from them and you know create stronger relationships and, and more success um, both in business and in life. And to close out, Amani Green had the most succinct advice of all. Save more money and stop procrastinating. <laughs> <laughs> you want honesty in your podcast? Thanks for listening to the Strategic Momentum Podcast. And a special thank you to everyone who has been here since our launch 50 episodes ago. It's really our mission to help you grow the core skills you need to ignite your personal and professional momentum and reach your full potential. You can get the contact information for any of the guests you've heard today in this show for this episode. Visit www.flywheelassociates.com backslash podcast backslash 50. If you have recommendations for other guests or topics you'd like covered, send me an email at info at flywheelassociates.com. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. While you're there, feel free to leave us a review, which helps others find the podcast. Finally, don't forget to follow Strategic Momentum on Facebook and Instagram, where we share daily tips and advice from guests on the show. I'm Connie Steele, and you've been listening to the Strategic Momentum Podcast.